everyone, and welcome to episode 67 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. This week's episode is brought to you by Podcorn, a new online marketplace where podcasters and sponsors can connect to bring the best of both worlds to you, the listener. Sponsors upload information about themselves, who they are, what they care about, and what they offer. And podcasters do the same, using the list feature to see what's out there and to find the best fit. Podcorn makes it possible for both sponsors and podcasters to collaborate and come up with content that works for everybody, especially you, so that you get the information that you can use. I like it because it gives me freedom, creativity, and flexibility, so I don't have to rely on ads that just don't work for us. So thanks, Podcorn, for sponsoring today's journey into the medieval world. To find out more about Podcorn and how it works, check out podcorn.com. Last week, we did a brief global tour of the medieval world with stops in North and Central America, Africa, and across Asia to the Pacific. This week, we're looking at a civilization much closer to Western Europe than the Pacific coast, both geographically and culturally, but a civilization that Western Europe increasingly was invested in seeing as foreign, the Byzantine Empire. To give us a rundown on Byzantium and its relationship to the West, I invited Dr. Anthony Caldellis to join me for this episode. Anthony is the chair of the Department of Classics at Ohio State University and the author of many books, including Roman Land, Ethnicity and Empire in Byzantium, Streams of Gold, Rivers of Blood, The Rise and Fall of Byzantium, 955 AD to the First Crusade, and Byzantium Unbound. He's also the host of an informative podcast called Byzantium and Friends, which next to my 5-Minute Medievalist logo has what's probably the coolest medieval logo out there. Here's our conversation on Byzantium, its place in history and in academic departments, and why it's an area of study that is definitely worth our time. Well, thank you for joining me, Anthony, to talk about Byzantium. And as I've just said to you when we were not recording, Byzantium is not a specialty of mine. So I'm going to come to this with humility and, you know, some idea of my own prejudice, but I hope you'll, you'll have some patience with me. So thanks for joining me. Hello, Danielle. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning. What is the Byzantine Empire? For people who know nothing of it, what is the Byzantine Empire? Sure. The Byzantine Empire is a modern label that we use to refer to the history of the Roman Empire after the fall of the Western half of the Roman Empire. So your listeners will know that there was a Roman Empire and it fell. Yep. (laughs) uh, Roughly in the 5th century A.D., And then other things happened in places like Italy and Gaul and Spain and Britain and so on. But the eastern half of the Roman Empire did not fall. It continued in existence for another 1,000 years. And so in the 7th century, it loses a lot of territories like Egypt and Syria to the Arabs. But it then continued on after that, and it lasted until 1453. And that eastern Roman Empire, which was predominantly Greek-speaking, and Christian Orthodox, and that's where the Orthodox churches of today come from, uh, genealogically. That continued to call itself the Roman Empire. Its majority population were Romans and so forth, but we call it the Byzantine Empire to distinguish it from the ancient Roman Empire, and for other ideological reasons, but let's make it easy and stick with (laughs) convenience. (laughs) Let's start there, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so before the Roman Empire, quote unquote, fell, it had already shifted its capital, right? It wasn't in Rome anymore. So where was the capital of the Roman Empire even before the quote unquote fall of it? Right. So there's some very interesting shifts that take place within the Roman Empire before the fall. A number of these are things like the extension of citizenship to the entire population. And the Romans took citizenship seriously. So in a sense, if you were a citizen, you were entitled to all of the rights and right. And so increasingly emperors and all the leaders and the senators and so on, they increasingly come from all over the empire, not just from the city of Rome. And the eastern half of the empire becomes increasingly more important. It had more cities. It probably had more wealth. It became more important strategically for a number of reasons. I'll just mention Goths and Persians. And eventually it made sense to build a capital for the empire in the east. And this is Constantinople. So the emperor Constantine builds this in the fourth century. He's also the first Christian emperor. 
And he builds Constantinople to be a kind of branch office of Rome in the east. And so it's also called New Rome. And that is the capital of the Byzantine Empire for the next thousand years. And it then became the capital of the Ottoman Empire when the Ottomans conquered uh, the Balkans. And today it's the city of Istanbul. Right. So a hugely important city for a really long time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been a capital of empires and uh, ever since then. And even today in Turkey, it's the largest city there. And the capital is Ankara. And so, so yes, no, people should go visit it. And it had tremendous history. So it has an imperial Roman history. It has a, an Orthodox history. There's the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia is there. Very many important events in Christian history took place there. So, for example, Christians, I think almost all Christian groups today, confess the creed of the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea is a city right by Constantinople. I mean, Constantinople hadn't been built. Constantine had just begun to build it at that time, but it's just across the Sea of Marmara. So, uh, yeah, a lot of things come out of there that are very important for Christian history, East and West. Yeah. And I've come to your work through your book, Byzantium Unbound, which we want to get at and talk about quite a lot. But one of the things you talk about in that book is you talk about the Byzantine Empire, Byzantium being sort of built in the space between things. So what do you mean by it sort of being built in the space between things? So it occupies these strange spaces that our categories for understanding history often don't accommodate that well, whether you look at it in space or time or whatever. So if you look at it in terms of time, Byzantium stretches from antiquity, really. Like, think of it as an era where people are still sacrificing to Zeus and there's still people who read hieroglyphics, right? So that's when it begins with the tiny part of the population being Christian. And it ends just short of Columbus. Like, they're right, there were people who witnessed the fall of Constantinople who heard about the New World. Like, so it stretches from almost deep antiquity to early modernity. And it kind of defies the categorization, ancient, medieval, modern, that we try to force all of history into. Yeah. <laughs> um, but all, yeah, and, and it's the same in terms of space. So these Western models that use East and West have never been able to quite decide where it falls because it's scrunched in there between Western Latin Europe, medieval Europe, and the Islamic world, and dealt with both throughout its long history. And also, it extended its culture to the north, so to like Bulgaria, and then Rus, Russia, and so forth. And so it operates in this space and time that's right, like in the middle of a large part of the world. So if you want to take as your as a big picture, everything from like the Indus River to Ireland, it's kind of right in the middle. And it stretches for so long that it's just a wonderful vantage point for seeing what's going on in that part of the world all around it. It's like a, it's like a constant point. Yeah, I like that idea of it being a constant point. And that's kind of what makes it so difficult to study because, as you say, a lot of the categories that we use to study things, it does not fit in them at all. So when I when I was learning about the Middle Ages kind of early on, I was learning about Western stuff, as most of us do. And for me, Byzantium was a completely different thing in that for me, it was it was still it felt like antiquity to me, like it felt like a different thing. And I think that part of that started, you know, part of it, it has to do with the scholarly tradition. But even in the Middle Ages in Europe, people were trying to really distinguish themselves as not being Byzantine. So how is that happening in the Middle Ages that people are saying, we are not that? Sure. But first, let me say that Byzantium is actually fairly accessible, especially these days. So I would encourage your readers to, if they've I don't know, played Assassin's Creed or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> and they feel, oh, I should learn more about this. It's actually very easy to do. Most of the important texts are translated. And and Byzantium is a fairly consistent and coherent, it's both a state and a society. And it has some through lines that tend not to change too much. The state structure, you know, Constantinople, orthodoxy. I mean, obviously there's change because it's history, but 
it's not like the medieval West, which in, by comparison is this chaos medley of peoples and places and states that come and go and dukes and barons and whatever. <laughs> it's nothing like that. Byzantium is a it's a it's a single state. It's fairly sophisticated. Um, and once you get the basics, like there's an emperor, there's a patriarch, Constantinople, there's provinces, taxes and armies. <laughs> you're, you're good. You're good to go. OK. Yeah, um, that's that's the thing. It's very stable and it's much different from medieval Europe. So, yeah. That's yeah. that's totally important to mention. It, it becomes more chaotic at the end. So it becomes much more like Western Europe, in part because, you know, the, one, the Fourth Crusade, one of these crusades in 1204 went over there and wrecked the place and it never quite reconstituted itself as before. And so it, it was a lot more chaotic after that point. But anyway, so to your question, in the earliest part of Byzantine history, it was regarded in the West and the East as for what it was, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, you know, it lost its Western provinces in the fifth century, but it, it remained intact in the East and it was considered the Roman Empire. So Western writers in like the fifth and sixth and seventh and even the early eighth century, that's just what they called it. Either the Imperium or the Res Publica, the Romana and so on. The emperor in Constantinople is the Roman Emperor. And so there's no problem. This begins to change in the eighth century especially when the papal state and especially under well this is intensifies in the ninth century like with pope nicholas the first and so on it develops its own version of roman continuity and a roman identity and appropriates it for itself and at the same time the frankish kings like charlemagne and so on they also lay claim to the roman legacy for their own reasons like they're doing their own projects <laughs> And, I like thinking that they're, they're doing their own project. They, they have their own, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, from a Byzantine standpoint, they're basically an indie film kind of scene. Like, <laughs> what are these barbarians doing in the West with all, you know, they're playing with, those, those aren't your toys. Put, put, those are my toys. Put, put my toys down. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it actually takes a while for this Roman ideology to solidify in the West enough because the, then the 10th century is just a mess and, and whatever. But eventually they do. And what happens is that Western sort of playing with ideas of Romanness turn against Byzantium in the way that, okay, like we're doing these Roman things and you're not Roman, you're something else. You're like Greek or whatever, which was not a, it was not a compliment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. So when they called them Greeks, the Byzantines, who did, the Greek the Byzantines did not call themselves Greeks. They were Romans. It meant things like shifty, faithless, treacherous, kind of effeminate, you know, that sort of thing. In other words, they were represented in such a way that they were fit to be conquered. And so over time, it just kind of became an entrenched axiom in Western thought that 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 thing over there in the East we don't need to factor it into our calculations about about history and culture and ideology and politics, because what matters is what's happening over here with like tensions between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor, these, these kinds of things. And we don't need to worry about that other fragment of the Roman tradition over there. And so over time, yeah, the prejudices kept mounting and, and they kept piling it on. So eventually you, the churches start to not get along very well. And so there are accusations of heresy and the fourth crusade doesn't help. <laughs> In fact, that's when, that's when this rupture really became a matter of like identity on the ground. Like until that point, it's states arguing and, you know, whatever, one year they get along, another year they don't. After that point, it became pretty fixed. And that's when you start to get a, a real split between Orthodox and Catholic. Yeah. And you're saying in your book that there is, it's called afterwards, it's called the, the Frankish occupation. There is like a time when it's occupied. And, and as you say, this becomes more about identity on the ground, where it's not just the people who are saying, well, we're Roman, we're Roman, and the people on the ground do not care. All of a sudden, it becomes an occupied area. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So there's a period when, well, I mean, your, your, your listeners can think of it as an extension of the Crusades. So the first crusade goes to you know, Palestine and sets up these sort of states. The fourth crusade does something of the same, but in the Aegean area. So they 
the, the army of the Fourth Crusade goes to Constantinople, and to make a long story short, it takes the pl- it burns the place, sacks it, plunders it, and then installs its own emperor. And then they divide up the rest of the empire into their little sort of fiefdoms and whatever, and the Venetians get their bit, and the Burgundians get their bit, and whatever. And they didn't get all the bits that they wanted, and so the Byzantines were able to reconstitute and come back, and 50-some years later, they took back Constantinople and reestablished as their capital. But a lot of places, like in Greece, especially the island of Crete, for example, like those were lost like forever to Byzantine rule and became uh, Western colonies. And Crete, for example, remained a Western colony until the end of the 17th century. The Ionian islands, these are these islands off the Western coast of Greece, um, like Ithaca, where Odysseus was from. Those always were part of, like they they never ceased being Western colonies until the 19th century, uh, when they were just handed over to the Greek state as a gift from, oh, who was it at the time? I can't remember. Anyway, they, they kept changing hands of French and the British and the whatever. Um, <laughs> That's pretty much modern history to me, too. The French yeah. and the British and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I should know this. I keep I keep reading it. I mean, I've been reading a lot of modern history lately, but you know the, the the speed with which these colonies and island colonies changed hands in the 19th century is it's kind of hard to remember all the details. But anyway, so there was this period that's kind of scrunched between Byzantine history and Ottoman rule where Greece and the islands were kind of divided between Western, like the Venetians or Burgundians, or even the Catalans got involved at one point. The locals, including locals like the Serbs and the Bulgarians and so on, and the Ottomans. And so there's this messy, messy period. But for the aspects of that period that fall letter like Western rule, in, in Greece at least, that's called the Frangokratia, like the Frankish occupation. Because the Byzantines, for their part, viewed most of Western Europe as a lump thing. The, the <laughs> yeah. Franks are the Latins. Yeah. Like they, because no, they, they didn't call them the Romans. They called them the Latins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Latins or or the, the Franks or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, because the terms Catholic and Orthodox didn't weren't used in the way that we use them today. They weren't used that way then. So when they were talking about church differences, like which church do you belong to, the terms that they would use would be Latin or Greek. And it was okay for the Byzantines, as I said, like to be referred to as Greek in language because they spoke Greek, like that's fine. And our church, the liturgy is in Greek, so that's fine. But they didn't think that that was excluded them from being Romans. But anyway, yeah, so there's this messy period of uh, Western colonial rule in some parts of the Byzantine territory, yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's important to bring up the whole language thing, because I think that was a place where people in the Middle Ages really, they grabbed onto it as saying that you are not Roman anymore because you've changed your language over. We are the ones still speaking Latin in our churches, you're speaking Greek. Um, But you've made the really good point that the fact that Greek is being spoken in Byzantium, well, the Byzantine Empire, makes it possible to access all sorts of a really long tradition of literature that continues. What kind of stuff were they writing that you think was really important in our understanding of extending that whole culture from antiquity to modernity? What are some of the things that you thought were great that were being written in Greek at that time? Yeah, so this is one of the great things about learning Greek, other than learning Greek, um, is that it gives you access to such a long tradition of of written texts, right, From, from Homer down to today. And obviously, the spoken language began to deviate from, you know, classical Attic Greek long before Byzantium. So the Greek that most Byzantines spoke was much, much closer to modern Greek. Like I could easily have a conversation with a Byzantine from the 9th century. Like that wouldn't be a problem. There'd there'd be some linguistic issues and possibly uh, some vowel sounds that I might have to adjust for but not that many. Like, I think we know when the last vowel fell to Yodicism, like all sounding, like, like the E sound, right? And I think Ypsilon became E um, by the 10th century. Anyway, whatever. So the spoken language deviates, but the Byzantines continue to write in registers of the language that are closer to ancient Greek. So if you learn ancient Greek, 
it's a skill that you can extend into the Byzantine period for another thousand years. So you can go from Homer down to the 15th century. So what that means is that Byzantine scholars, who are not all monastic, let's be clear about that. Byzantium had a thriving lay intellectual scene. The monasteries were only one part of book production and reading. So they had all the ancient Greek classics. Let me put that a bit differently, that because that that way of phrasing it kind of disguises what really happened. To a considerable degree, the Byzantines chose which ancient books count as classics, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. So because there's a process of reception and, and filtering going on there, right? So the, there was a selection going on. So to some degree, they followed ancient priorities. So yeah, Homer and tragedians and Thucydides, like, yeah, and Plato, like, those texts were already established classics in antiquity. And so they remain so in Byzantium. But around that core, they made a lot of choices about what to keep and what not to keep and why to keep it. And those choices fundamentally shaped the classical canon that we have today, right? So classicists who often don't pay much attention to Byzantium are, in fact, working in a house that the Byzantines built. They just don't want to acknowledge that. They don't step outside the house to look at it from the outside and say, well, why does it look like that? Why does it have all these rooms and it doesn't have any room like that, right? Like, why doesn't any lyric poetry survive? But why do we have all of Plutarch's lives? Well, we don't have all of them, but why do we have so many of them? Like, so, so those are the kinds of questions that point to the Byzantine contribution. Moreover, the Byzantines are the only ones who have this literary archive. Now, some ancient texts have been translated into Latin and some were translated into Arabic, especially in the uh, ninth century. But this is a crucial difference. So Arab scholars were interested primarily in ancient Greek scientific thought and philosophy, also like the occult and alchemy and things like that, but not in Homer or Demosthenes, right? And what they thought was Aristotle wasn't Aristotle. For a long time, it was Plotinus. They thought it was Aristotle. So while they definitely invested a lot in ancient Greek thought, they didn't do so in ancient Greek literature or philology, like you couldn't read Greek. So it's a different kind of engagement with the past. In Byzantium, it was very much about the text, the Greek of the text, and they were just in love with it. And so they had a lot more philology, even though they didn't have anything remotely like the science of the Arabs. Like, no, no, Byzantines are not. <laughs> they had flamethrowers. They had <laughs> flamethrowers. But you don't learn those from Homer. <laughs> That's true. I'm sure he could describe them beautifully, though. <laughs> yes, yes. He could probably coin some words that mimic the sound of a flamethrower, whatever that is. <laughs> um, but no, so, yeah, Byzantium is not a terribly scientific, it's like theoretical scientific culture in that regard. But it definitely loved its Homer. It's loved the dictionaries, commentaries, all of that. Yeah, they're totally into that. So, so when it comes to classical culture, we have what the Byzantines preserved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's important because uh, so often we, we will look at something and this is a canon of literature or it's a canon of scientific literature. And there is this idea that it's always been that way. And uh, it's right. very helpful to look at how did it get to be this way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so the, the model that we're critiquing here is the cold storage model. Like ancient, ancient stuff gets put into the time capsule and we just have to wait, set our watch, wait for 1453, and then all these Italian humanists can show up and save antiquity from the dead hand of Byzantium that, you know, never really knew what it had here. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, these are colonial discourses, by the way. I mean, so the idea that a culture's ancient past has to be rescued from its current present and be airlifted to some Western museum or archive in order to save it from itself. Yeah, I mean, these are... We know what that is now. There are disciplines sometimes haven't caught up to, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. No, you're right. I mean, when it comes to understanding cultures in general. So so the reason I wrote this, this little book, which, which is a, it's provocative, it's deliberately provocative, possibly even unhinged. Um, <laughs> I would say provocative, not unhinged. It, okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, nothing in it is false to my knowledge, but what I was trying to do was imagine what it would be like if Byzantium didn't have to play by other 
people's rules because it always has to as a discipline. I mean, as, as, not Byzantium itself, but it, the way it's been studied in sort of Western Academy has always been in deference to other more prestigious, more powerful, more well-funded fields, such as classics and such as Western medieval studies. And it always has to play by their rules in order to to be allowed into the club, in order to attain any kind of visibility, right? So that distorts some of its own priorities and it causes the field to have to engage in a double amount of labor. Like I'm, to compare a small thing with larger things. So, so for example, in systems of patriarchy, right, women have to think twice. They have, they have their own thoughts, but they also have to be thinking what men are thinking in order to operate in that world, right? But the men don't have to think what the women are thinking, yeah. right? And ditto for systems of racial hierarchy, right? So, you know, black men in the street have to always be thinking about what, how they're perceived by white people, whereas the reverse doesn't necessarily happen. Um, so obviously those are serious social problems that we face today. And I, I don't mean to, you know, compare, um, you know, academic hierarchies to them. It's not like that, but it's a similar kind of process where if Byzantinists want to have dialogues with these other fields, they have to do the work of learning how to speak to those other fields in their own terms. Whereas, you know, classicists and medievalists will often not bother to like you you explain things to us we're not going to learn your we're not going to go into your toy room and play with any of your toys uh, the, like i said they're very accessible um yeah. it's very easy to learn about byzantium now and, and fairly easy to do so so yeah there, there are all these uh, fraught relationships with these fields you know like when you have classicists saying oh you're not a classicist you're a byzantinist because there's a there's a point where you can't draw that difference really it's not meaningful or with medieval studies especially when you get into complicated areas of like religious controversy and you know the catholic orthodox disputes that go way 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 back right and and that sort of becomes a not dangerous but it's a it's a contested area at both ends like either you're dealing with actual controversialists who want to like, well, the Byzantines got this wrong about the Holy Spirit or whatever, right? Or at the other end, when you're having these ecumenist movements and they're always trying to find middle ground, they're also the Byzantines' actual sense of difference from the Catholic West gets downplayed so that a common ground can be found today. So the, all, there are all these modern ideologies that make it difficult to say, well, no, they, many Byzantines at the end, for example, had built their identity around not being Catholic, yeah. like resisting Catholic rule. And that had profound consequences for the modern world. Like still, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Like it, there's a reason why in Orthodox countries today, like from Moscow to Athens and whatever, there's just great suspicion whenever Western armies get involved in something and cite idealistic motives. The first instinct is like, we've seen this before, <laughs> right? And, you know, whatever it is, like whether you're going to go fight for feminism in Afghanistan, right? Or whatever you say you're doing, right? It's like, no, I don't think you're doing that. <laughs> After the sack of Constantinople, everyone is saying, beware of Westerners bearing gifts, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yes, that's well put. Yes, yes. Not, yeah. So, yeah, that left a, a lasting legacy. Uh, in fact, I remember this was, what, in 99 or 98, uh, Pope John Paul II, he, he came to Greece and there, there were riots and he apologized for the Fourth Crusade, which is a bit weird. I mean... Anyway, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> that's probably a whole another episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but just to show you, like, how deeply this runs. Right. And so, yeah, getting back to modern disciplines, there are some asymmetries and there are some imbalances in how fields communicate. And Byzantium has always had interest, has always excited interest among many, you know, Western scholars, a minority, like you're normally, that's normally not where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always been a steady stream of, of very capable scholars um, in, in the West and also in Orthodox countries. 
that find it fascinating and and get really into it. And so it has it has thrived as a discipline. And so as a result, we know a lot about it. And and that knowledge is increasing. It's it's an area where you can actually make new discoveries. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the holy grail. <laughs> if that's the not the wrong term to use, is finding new stuff to discover. And it's it's yeah. kind of crazy when you think that there is this whole empire that's been sitting there with all of the, I mean, a thousand, more than a thousand years of history for people to just dig into, but they don't. So I'm going to give you the chance to tell us why should people study Byzantium? Because that's one of the things that you say in your book is that you feel like you kind of have to sell it to people. (laughs) Like you need to get people interested. And the way to do that is to, is to try and find what got you interested in it, right? That's a good way to invite people into your field. So what's, what's exciting about Byzantium? Why should people be interested in it? Right. Well, so there are people and, and there are people. Um, so there are different reasons that work for different groups. And I, I tried in this book to just kind of target a broad range of interests that might excite people. So in my case, I was never planning to be a business. <laughs> so I was a physicist, but that's a, that's a, a whole other story. Um, I got to Byzantium via philosophy and the history of philosophy. And it happens somewhat in the following way. I realized that the history of, like just Western generic boring philosophy, right? That it was entangled in things like its Greek roots, ultimately Greek roots, right? The Christian context in which modern philosophy evolved. And for some reason that I can't remember now exactly right now, that Roman, especially Roman law, but also sort of Roman templates for state formation were very important in, in early modern political philosophy which is kind of where I started, like early modern political philosophy. And eventually I realized that the only society in history that combined all of those three things in as close to their original form as possible was Byzantium, in that it was Greek speaking, its literary tradition was the ancient Greek classics, which it it itself shaped. It was a Roman state with Roman law and its citizens had a Roman identity. And it was also the crucible of historical Christianity in terms of the church councils, the organization of the church, doctrine, theology, asceticism, all of that. All of that comes from these two or three centuries, four, five, six, right, toward the beginning. And I was, wow, this is, a, this is a fascinating laboratory to study how all of these things interact. And once you start seeing it that way, all of, all of these other aspects of it open up. And um, I'll, I'll just cite one, for example, that at the time was quite fascinating to me was when, when I was in grad school, um, hospitals. And Timothy Miller has written this wonderful book on how the Byzantines, I mean, they didn't invent hospitals in the sense of, you know, someone sitting at a drawing board and sort of working it out. But they evolved as these institutions that combined Greek medicine and medical skill. And in the 12th century, they even had to, they even had exams that they had to pass and the knowledge of Galen, right? With Christian philanthropy, especially monastic philanthropy, so you know, monks, but many monasteries had a hospital wing, and the monks would care for patients. That was just part of the service, and the institutional support by the Roman state, and endowments and things like that. And there you see, like you take this one institution and you analyze it in those terms, and it it makes a whole lot of sense, and it, it's a wonderful thing because that didn't exist. In the West, not for a very long time. And I should say that in, in some respects, Byzantium is far, far ahead of anything around it. I, I'll give you an example. Western historians of political regimes get super excited. Like it's a it's a transformational moment when some medieval state finally manages to figure out how to tax its subject. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> All of a sudden, we can pay for stuff. (laughs) Yes. And, okay, but, you know, whole regimes of responsibility and accountability and law and so forth emerge from that. And this is like some defining feature of modernity. Like, some theorists will even say, well, you don't have a state until there's this. And, like, in Byzantium, that's all the way through. Like, that's a given. That's just a late Roman state. You have a census of lands. You know, you allocate 
units of value to each land. You have a budget. You decide what you need. You divide one by the other, and there's your tax rate. You post it. I mean, it. <laughs> no, no, it's it's really something as a Byzantinist to read these models of the evolution of states in the West. And, and for some reason, they've been taken as sort of canonical, as if when you reach the modern nation state, okay, that's the, that's the holy grail, like I said, right? And they're so excited when they reach things that are just thousands of years old in, in the Roman tradition. Anyway. Yeah, well, as you're talking, I'm thinking this is the description that you have in the book. And it's also kind of the idea I've always had of Byzantium in my head, where the Byzantines are sitting there going... I don't know what these people are doing in, in Europe. They're just going to, we'll just let them figure themselves out because we got our system. It works really well. We are happy. We like our literature and we will just let them fight amongst themselves until they settle out and just see what happens. Yeah. So th there was prospect for good relations between the Byzantines and the Latins. I don't think that either side wanted to fight so much. And you, you find many instances of cooperation and very productive cultural exchange and all of that. It's just that incrementally over time, the moments of conflict tended to be worse than the aggregate of the positive interactions. So it was always like two steps back, one forward, two steps back. And, and it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tense history. Until you get to the very, very end, when in fairly stark terms, the Byzantines kind of had to decide whether they wanted to be ruled by the Ottomans or by Western Latin Catholics. And by and large, they opted for the Ottomans, which might sound odd, but like neither was a good option. <laughs> right? Yeah, they didn't want either. But the difference was that the Ottomans would kind of let them be who they were. They would be Orthodox and they would be Romans. And the Ottomans had no interest in changing that. But in, under Western regimes, they would be forced to be Catholic in many cases, and they would force to be Greek. And they didn't want, they weren't those things. And so I, I think to a certain degree, that kind of drift toward the East in the later Byzantine period was a result of what you might call identity politics. Yeah, that was a moment I, that really spoke clearly to me in the book as well, where you're saying the Latins were saying you are Greeks and not listening to the people who are saying we are Romans. And I think when you get to that point where you have an outside people saying who you are, when you're that's not who you say who you are. I think that's a really, that's a really, well, it's a defining moment. Yeah. So it really spoke to me. Whereas the Arabs and the Turks always called them Rum. Yeah. 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 So... It in those terms, you know, it's, well, I don't think that history is ever simple either. You know, no. when you're actually in that moment, you have to have considered all the factors that have gone into it. And uh, the fact that nobody had the benefit of seeing what was going to happen next. But I think that you've really made a good case for it, the fact that everyone should study Byzantium and not forget about it and definitely not think of it as removed from, you know, the rest of the world. Obviously, it's it's got its own culture that is an extension of ancient Roman culture and that it was integrated. It was part of the rest of the world and that had lots of great contributions. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, yeah, one one thing which might have been obvious from what I've said, but it, I think it should be pointed out explicitly is that there are not many states in history that survive for that long Yeah, and survive under fairly difficult circumstances. Um, so there was there's an element of having it togetherness <laughs> that they did. Right. So if you want to study how states can recover from really serious crises, um, how they pull it together, in particular, how they and the Byzantine state was very good at this, at generating support among its population for the whole project while taxing them sufficiently to maintain it and avoiding things like agrarian revolts or breakaway, you know, independence movements. Now, some of those happened later on, but for most of that history, it was a state that managed to strike the right balance of taxing enough to have a serious army without alienating the population and ensuring buy-in. And one of that was you have to have open institutions. So there's no, there's no formal class system. There's no family right. People can 
under certain circumstances, they can, there's a lot of social mobility, especially in the army and the church. Uh, emperors came from all social backgrounds, at least in the middle period for the most part. Later on, it was much more aristocratic. Uh, so yeah, for those who are interested in why states survive or, or fail, it's a, probably the most paradigmatic case of, of survival. Yeah. And I mean, if for no other reason, that is a good reason to study it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about Byzantium today. I'm going to give people the link to your podcast, which is Byzantium and Friends, so that they can learn more about Byzantium. Yes. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> thank you so much. You can listen to Byzantium and Friends at byzantiumandfriends.podbean.com. And you can find out more about Anthony's work at caldellispublications.weebly.com. That's K-A-L-D-E-L-L-I-S publications.weebly.com. Byzantium Unbound is available now on Amazon or through Arc Humanities Press. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Well, we've got a lot of news this week on Medievalist.net. Um, there's one really impressive early medieval Pictish uh, settlement in Scotland that's been discovered. We also have a great piece of yours that I want to talk about. It's, it's this 12th century advice manual, which has some pretty good advice for the present day, as you found. So, um, yeah, lots of great lines that you kind of uncovered. Uh, my favorite is... Enjoy delightful music from time to time. Look for things that are good for you. <laughs> yeah, I came across that and thought it was pretty important for people who are still <laughs> self-isolating or social distancing. You know, you got to take care of yourself. But yeah, this is a, a book of manners for the civilized man. It's got all sorts of good advice in it. But I picked out a couple that I thought really spoke to 2020. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that. So uh, we've got a couple of new pieces by you on this on the site this week. And uh, we're just kind of gearing up because we've got a lot of pieces from our columnists that are just waiting for me to edit and get ready on the web website. So hopefully in the next couple of days, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff go out. <laughs> it all depends on you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for keeping this podcast going. If you love the podcast, please consider checking out our Patreon page where there are always sweet deals on Medieval Warfare magazine, the Medieval magazine, and our very own book club. Without the support of you amazing listeners, this wouldn't be possible, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. You can find all our awesome deals at Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For more on Byzantium and the whole medieval world, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist, and you can find all my books at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening. Have yourself a wonderful day.